because you're jumping back into the gut. Oh, let's hey, go. Coach. Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. I appreciate you joining us for this week's podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit basketballimmersion.com for more coaching resources and access to all the basketball podcasts. I hope you will give us a shout out on social media, on Twitter at Bball Immersion, or on Instagram at Basketball Immersion to help me continue to share the game. Enjoy the episode. Coach is super excited today to have Sandy Brondella here. Is Sandy is the head coach of the Australian Women's National Team, as well as head coach of the Phoenix Mercury of the WNBA. She has previously won a WNBA championship, been coach of the year in the WNBA, and was inducted into the Australian Basketball Hall of Fame in 2010. And uh, Sandy, that's just a short list of your accomplishments. If we go back to you as a player as well, just a tremendous career in basketball. So thank you for joining us. Uh, you're welcome, Chris. Thanks for the invite. Uh, long, long overdue. I've heard your name so many times and uh, have so many people in Australia that uh, speak so highly of you. And uh, it's going to be exciting. And uh, today we're going to dive into a whole bunch of different things. But uh, wanted to start with the difference in the WNBA and the international game since you're pulling double duty nowadays. Yeah, yes, I am. Look, there, there are some differences. And I think the most notable difference would be the rules. Um, FIBA basketball doesn't have uh, the, the defensive uh, three-second rule like the NBA and the WNBA do. Um, we have less timeouts. Uh, they're only in one minute. You have two in the first half and three in the second. Um, no jump balls anymore. It's possession arrows and there's only five fouls. So there's a lot of, you know, I mean, there's a lot of similarities. It's still basketball, but, um, you know, the rules, um, you know, coaching two different teams, I have to adjust to, to the rules as well. Um, but yeah, so that's, you know, there's other variations, but, uh, um, you know, I'm just grateful that I get to coach in two different teams. Well, no doubt. And uh, more similar than obviously the, the college game and going to the international game or something like that, clearly in terms of uh, a little bit of the strategy and some of the similarities as well. Right. Yeah. Look, it, you know, obviously I don't change my system from one team to the other. Obviously, I have some tweaks uh, that I have to adjust, but uh, I think it's been a little bit easier for me uh, coaching both teams without having making, um, you know, just great adjustments because I have two very dominant post players um, in Liz Cambage and Brittany Griner with the respective teams. So, um, you know, it's all about making sure that, um, you know, I, I'm big on offensively ball player movement and getting everybody involved, but understanding that obviously the best players, I want the ball in their hands too, um, you know, when we need to make a play, but everybody's important to making it happen. And, and the same thing applies for Phoenix. You know, I've got great playmakers. I've got, you know, obviously a great big there too. And you want to make sure, you know, you're being hard to guard at every single time and then you're getting great shots every single position. Well, and I'm glad you brought up that point. First of all, we're going to come back and talk about your unique players that you've coached because you've you've been blessed, I'm sure, with uh, having coached some really unique talent. But you mentioned ball movement, and that does seem to be a big difference sometimes between the FIBA game and, say, the WNBA or the NBA game is just the number of false motions or the actions before the actions that happen in the international game. Yeah, look, I think that's so true. With, um, you know, obviously no defensive three-second rule, uh, people can just stay in there. And, you know, most teams have dominant players where uh, the, oppo the opponents are trying to take that away. So for Liz, for example, obviously she's going to see a crowd. So it's putting her in positions that they're all one-on-one -on -one coverage or if they are bringing a trap, how do we exploit that in overload situations, getting three players on one side? Um, and I think the best way to do that is just through a lot of movement. Um, and sometimes you, you, you call it the false movement, and that's what it's about, just getting players in the right position so you can get a high-quality shot every single position. Um, look, I try, you know, I think even with the, the Mercury I have, you know, Dinah Tracy, I think one of the greatest pick and roll players um, of all time. And not just because of her scoring ability and her decision, but it's also about her decision making out of it. She's one of the best passes and she sees the floor before it actually happens. She reads defense as well. So, you know, we're still putting players in a position where they can be successful. But I think ball player movement is is the most important thing in basketball to get high quality shots. 
Well, it's it's great to get your perspective and to give people perspective uh, because again, watching both games, it's it's so fun to watch and there are some unique things. But the thing that we really wanted to dive a little bit deeper with you with is that you've coached some really unique talent and talking about some of the difference and you've already brought up these names, Griner, Cambridge and Tarasi. Let's start with the two bigs because you've coached arguably the two most dominant bigs in the women's game over, would we say the last 10 years? Yeah, yeah, I, I would probably say that. I think, I mean, so they rank up there as, you know, the best, probably best of all time too with the the skill set that they have, their versatility that they have. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm obviously very lucky that I'm able to do that. So, and, and again, in the women's game, a big truly still does have such a huge impact, right? Like we haven't gone to this analytics game where we're going to completely play on the perimeter because in the women's game, a big can dominate the game. And Griner showed that obviously through her college career. She shows that in the WNBA. And for those that haven't seen Cambridge play, I mean, she didn't play in the WNBA this year, right? But she's just tremendous and, uh, you know, such unique talents in their ability to be able to play and score efficiently around the basket. Yeah, it certainly is. Look, obviously, I think, you know, obviously everyone's big on analytics. You know, they want to take more threes. I'm no different. I still want to take a lot of threes, but I still want to make sure we're getting, um, you know, obviously there's points at the rim as well too, and there's uh, ways to do that. That's, uh, you know, with penetration, pass penetration into a big player, a.k.a., uh, you know, Liz Griner and uh, Liz Cambage and now uh, Brittany Griner, or, you know, with uh, dribble penetration. But, look, the I think you have to play. For me as a coach, I play to the strengths of the team. Um, and having a six foot eight dominant inside player, obviously, it means that I should be having some emphasis of playing to those particular players because I think that will also open up for the outside shots and then taking more threes as well too. Um, so yeah, it's not really a five out. I mean, when she's off the court, you just try to do as five out as much as we can. And, and Brittany and Liz are both, um, you know, they're both capable three point shooters. Although it's not. You know, that's not the, the best part of the game yet, but I hope that's an area that they'll continue to um, work and improve um, over these coming years. I'm sure they will. And uh, a few things that come into it. First of all, high, low and duck ins still a part of the game plan when you have such size advantages or such skill advantages near the rim. Yes, definitely. Like I said, it's just utilising the strengths that you have. And I think as coaches, that's what we're trying to do. How can we be the best possible team that we can be without taking away that ball player movement? Because it's it's way more fun when you're moving the ball. Um, but there are times where you have mismatches or, you know, you have an advantage inside. But that we're definitely looking at it like the duck-ins uh, out of reversal, um, ducking in and both of uh, Liz and, and, and Brittany are great at doing that. And, and high-low, high-low. And really, to be quite honest, um, I always say that post-passing is kind of a lost cause at the moment. Uh, Diana is extremely great at it. But, you know, a lot of players haven't played with six-foot-eight uh, players, uh, especially if they're new to the teams um, that I coach. And it takes time for them, um, you know, both of them to adjust to each other and about where they, they need the ball or how to get the ball in there. But, you know, to overcome trapping, obviously high-low passing, um, is critical as well because, um, you know, you'll hopefully get a one-on-one -on -one coverage down low. I imagine, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well. Another part of it is learning how to play off of them once the ball's in the post. And for a lot of players, that would be an adjustment as well. Yeah, it certainly is. It's certainly something that we um, work on in, in the respective teams. Um, you know, obviously they demand so much attention. So, you know, if it is a trap, who – you know, the rules are for us, whoever traps, that's who's cutting to the basket to create um, more open looks on skip passes. Um, or sometimes if you see a little congestion and they're just loading up the paint, I mean, we just encourage uh, Brittany or Liz just pass it out and reseal again, you know, or, or we can look for a skip and then a reseal on the, on the reverse pass. So, you know, the work goes into it. It's not just people standing. And, you know, we do fall into that at times where we just stand and watch. And I think, that's the hardest part because it's not what I want. Um, but, you know, we've got to isolate down low, but we still got to have the appropriate movement. So we can get, as I always keep talking about, great shots every position. You, you talked about Tarassi in the ball screen, and we'll come back and we'll talk about her. But just in general, in talking about using these two unique players, Griner and Cambridge, in a ball screen or in an off-the-ball action, if you needed a basket, which would be your go-to to be able to get them in the spot they want to be? You know, it would either really, 
it really depends who would be coming off and how they, they were defending her. But, look, we obviously put BG in a lot of uh, pick and rolls and because uh, everyone's concerned about her rolling to the basket. So is it as aggressive on the ball against our, you know, great playmates that we have um, or are they allowing her to roll? So, you know, a, a side pick and roll, a spread look when it's an overloaded look where, you know, you know, what are they going to do? Are we opening up the floor for our playmakers or can we reverse it or throw it back for a, pick, for, for a pass in? So it really depends on how they're defending it. I do like to put some down screen action in between BG and Diana um, because I think that's extremely hard to guard when you've got a great shooter come off and also a great passer that reads defensive well can make the decision whether she's open to shoot the ball or um, if there's a little bit of overhelp that she can pass it on the roll to the basket and get an easy one where defense is not set and they can bring a trap. When they're rim running off of rolls, are, are you seeing adjustments on the weak side in terms of how teams are tagging? Uh, I'm imagining as well you're not seeing as much switching versus them. Uh, less switching against BG. I mean, I think switching is such a dominant, uh, you know, a lot. every team is using switching and sometimes probably overusing it, to be quite honest. But, you know, against BG or Liz, you don't see as much switching. They try and keep the big on big as much as we can. And, you know, we're no different. We want to keep our best defenders and our most physical defenders on the big players. Uh, if we're guarding a Sylvia Fowles, for example, from rolling us up deep to the basket. So, and then it's more about, yeah, the tagging. I mean, Tagging is, is important, but if you've got shooters around it, it makes it extremely hard because the throwback, you know, if it's a side pick and roll overload and, and BG sets a screen on Diana or or Skylar and, you know, Diana's in the corner and you're coming off, you're throwing it back to a three-point shooter. Um, and then it's more about what kind of movement do you have on the, off, the back side that, can occupy the defense and you know we talked about cutting is extremely important too because they want to focus on one player that means somebody else is open and making sure we're cap uh, we're, we're cutting into the gaps um, for open looks or being quick to the next action is which is something that I'm you know I, I talk about a lot so bringing Tarasi into the conversation a little bit and we'll talk about her individually but if you're thinking about these three and you've coached many great players for your years. So we're not just focused on these three, but when you have such a unique talent or such an all time player, what are some of the things that you maybe do differently because you have that level of a player? Um, look, I try not to do anything differently and I just try and uh, put the ball in, um, you know, play a player style of play that suits the players that I have and but making sure to highlight my best players. And, I, and, you know, I think that's the goal. And the goal of the other team is trying to stop those best players and, um, you know, making your other players shoot. And that's why I say it's all about um, moving the ball. And we've got a really, um, you know, we've got an unselfish group. And I think that's what where you can score the most points is not forcing the action, is just making sure, you know, everyone's doing their role to make sure that we get a great um, great action. So because Diana and, and BG and Liz, it's not, all, it's not just about scoring for them. They want to win. And I think that's uh, what it comes down to, and that's the kind of quality players that you have on a team. It makes it easier from my part. Um, but, yeah, so, yeah, I totally forgot the question now. But No, that's okay. You, you answered it, Coach. And the other part is that you've talked about it, that all players are different in their personalities. So they're different in their personality, but they're somewhat similar, aren't they, as well? Yeah, look, they are. You know, obviously, to be – spoken about as one of the greatest of all times um you know you have to have that self-belief as well but you have to have that work ethic and and on you would hear a lot of interviews when people say what makes Diana Trussie special and I said what makes her special is her will to win like it doesn't matter it's not about scoring you know and I think and I do agree some players it's all about scoring and maybe that's what their team needs with Diana and, and Brittany it's all about winning you know, what do I need to make us to be the most successful team? Um, and, but, you know, Diana too, I mean, obviously just very disciplined in her approach. But not all players, all the great players don't need to be that. Some, you know, they have a lot of pressure. Obviously everyone expects them, expects there's a lot of expectations on them, which is not always easy. Um, so, you know, their personality differs because, you know, some of them, like BG needs to have a be a little bit looser, you know. She's focused when she get, you know crosses over, but needs a little bit a little bit looser in her preparation. Whereas Dinah, you know, she's you know where it's all about work here, 
So there's no right or wrong. It's more about getting those players in the right mindset that when we do get into the game that they're totally locked in, they're focused and they're good to go and and that's what works best for them. So I don't kind of put anyone in a, in a box in that regard. It's like you know what you need to do to get ready and, and that's what they do. Hey, Coach, a quick interruption from this episode for a mention from our supporters who, without them, this podcast would not be possible. By using the links I mentioned in these advertisements, it enables me to continue providing this podcast for free for you. The wait is finally over. Football is in full effect, with many teams strutting their stuff. You might not be at a game this year, but you can still be in on the action at Bet Online. Bet Online is going the extra mile to make sure you can get in on everything imaginable this season. From game spreads and totals to team, player, and coaching props, Bet Online gives you more options to wager than any place online. Head to Bet Online today and use promo code ARMCHAIR, that's ARMCHAIR in all capitals, to take advantage of all the great sign up bonuses. Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts. In your observations and in your conversations with uh, Tarasi, I'm curious, how, what, what makes her so special in ball screen? Because she's clearly, again, one of the all-timers in ball screen. She reads defense as well. Look, she's, she's been a pro for 16 years. And it's funny when you talk to her that, you know, obviously everyone watches UConn play. They, they're not a, they don't run a lot of pick and rolls. Not um, at so all, this, yeah. Yeah, so this is something that she's developed. But, look, I think she has obviously that – she has that toughness. She's got that mental toughness, not just the physical toughness. Um, she has shooting ability like no other. Um, her range is amazing. Um, her passing ability. So she has all the attributes to make her a great pick and roll um, player. Um, and then experience kind of helps. The more you see, the better you get. Um, but look, she she can shoot behind a screen. Um, you know, she can do the kickback. She can, she you know can pass one handed with both hands. Um, and find open players, she you know, no look passes. I, I think that's, you know, she knows how to set herself up to be effective in pick and roll defense. So a lot goes into it. It's not just, you know, she'll come with speed, when to go a little bit slow, when to put them on your back. You know, she understands how they're defending her and when to move. Um, but, yeah, being a great shooter and a great passer certainly helps. Tremendous. Tremendous. And uh, I'm curious, having watched her for so long, is there some takeaway that you say, okay, listen, we, we would obviously like to duplicate this player. What are some of the things that maybe you now think, okay, we should have spent more time on this in development of players at a younger age or at a college age or whatever it may be, because this is the quality that really helps separate you. Yeah, that's a really, really great, a great question because, you know, I, I think now I think the quality is, is is really just how she prepares. I mean, it's not just rocking up to the gym and getting on the court and going through the motions. Um, she's one of the smartest basketball players I've ever been around. Um, so she's a, she studies the game, and I think that's what you have to do. I mean, what where's the trend? She's always watching basketball and and, and learning and. And, you know, you get onto the court, she's working hard at all parts of her game. Um, and it's nothing fancy. You know, she's not doing five between the legs dribbles or behind the back and create a shot. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, dribbling is extremely important and she's great at that, but it's just having that great feel for the game. Um, and shooting, shooting different variations and, um, you know, but having she has a fantastic technique. Um, and look. She's, you know, it's, she's just, it really it's just a, amazing. So it's been great. I've had a, a courtside seat, a seat for many, many years now just to, to see the greatness that she has and, and it's still nothing slowing her down. She's just finished, uh, had a fantastic season in the WNBA. Yeah, she's tremendous. And, uh, you know, I think about a player like that and I go purposeful and skilled, but with the confidence or the freedom to be who she is. And sometimes as coaches, it's dangerous, right? Because we can take away that confidence and freedom. Yeah, that that's so true. And I think obviously being a former player, um, not not at Diana's standard by any means, but you know you liked it when you were in a, a situation when you knew the coach believed in you, um, you know, gave you confidence to play your game and didn't put you in a box. And that's look, I, you know. Uh, you know, coming into the coaching profession, I mean, you know, I love the game so much, and that was the key for me. It's like you, 
the goal is to put players in the right position so that that the team can have success, but the individual can have success. And 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 creating a game, well, uh, a system that um, suits the players that you have, and that may mean you get different players in that you have to make adjustments to your playbook or how you you know, if you defensively, how you want to play. Um, so, you know, I think it's more about, you know, making sure you're putting the players in the best spots they can to be successful, but, and then enjoying it. It's a team game. I'm all about teamwork. Um, so I think you get more satisfaction when you allow players, you know, some freedom, there's, there's rules, but there's freedom because really in offense, it's the first part of the offense is that's where the structure is. And then from that, we have concepts and then it's just them. It's the decision-making process. I love hearing that and uh, coachable. I, 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 all three players I imagine are coachable, but at the same time, you're able to hold them accountable. Yes. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, they're, they're all coachable, um, which has made my job easier um, in that regard. They're all winners. Um, you know, that doesn't mean we won't have discussions from time to time, and I do my best to hold them accountable because I think everybody needs accountability, uh, me included. And um, But, you know, they've been great. I mean, you know, I, I don't want – and I sometimes – I don't want it always to be easy. Sometimes it needs to be uncomfortable to have some growth. Um, and I always say, yeah, I hold the, everybody accountable, but sometimes the, the, the best players are, are a little different. I mean, they're going to take the most shots, aren't they? Um, you know, and I, it's not that I disrespect anybody else. I have utmost respect for everybody and I, try, I do my best to hold everybody accountable. But, you know, sometimes, the, um, you know, I admit the best players probably uh, have a little bit more of a leash. <laughs> well, and as they should. And they've earned it, right? Their hard work, their effort has earned that. And uh, you've talked, you talked about that a little bit, but how are those conversations? If I'm talking to a high school coach now or some type of club level coach, and I'm talking to them, they've got a unique talent, a star player. How do we have that conversation with the rest of the team that, hey, listen, this player should be getting more shots than you? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a really great thing. I think um, it, it's being transparent. Um, you know, I think every, you know, we're coming into WNBA of the beauty of coaching and the best players in the world, but you still have to have uh, people have to accept their roles. So I think the biggest thing for me that I encourage all coaches is before going into a season is to, to, stel- to stel- uh, establish the, the culture that you want. And that's really driven by the players. And that's what I try to do in conversations leading into the season or in training camp is, you know, you know what do we need to do or be to be the most successful team um, and, you know, accepting roles is one of them. Not everybody can be the chief, you know, you need some Indians. So, that mean, so you have to be, you have to have, um, you've got your best players and then you've got your role players, but every single one, I try and make everyone seem import, uh, feel important because they are important if you want to have great success. Um, I look back to our 2014 team, you know, my starting five all had uh, double figure sh- scoring and the bench were very useful and some players didn't play, but we, you know, we won a championship that year, but at times in the last game of the year, Brittany Griner got hurt, couldn't play. And I had to put a player in, I hadn't played much of, but she was ready for it because, you know, we kept, she kept working hard. I mean, it's, you know, you have to control the controllables as, as a player on the bench well too. But, you know, came in, I gave her the confidence just to play a game. You don't have to be a Brittany Griner. Um, but I think, you know, it's just being uh, dis- establishing that culture early so that you can always go back to it. And, um, and but, you know, having, you know, making sure communication and building relationships, I think that's extremely important. Um, and I think, you know, once they're in the game and, you know, everyone wants to shoot the ball, but it's more about, you um, you're playing attractive basketball and getting everyone involved, but knowing that, you know, obviously you want the best player taking the big shots when it really matters. Totally. Totally. And uh, you, let's, let's go back to the post players maybe again. What's the biggest challenge on offense of playing with a dominant post player? Uh, I think, you know, we've talked about it. It it kind of slows us down a little bit because maybe we have to, um, you know, making sure that we're getting post touches because that's obviously uh, is going to be a way that we can score. Um, you know, I've seen it this off season. You know, Brittany. You know, we need to get the ball into her, but sometimes it slows down. You know, obviously our the pace of the game. Um, 
and 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 I talked about you know I don't think it's kind of a lost art with post passing. So we're you know we force the action a little bit where we kind of should be moving it. Um, you know, and I think, but they you know they need the ball. So it's more about having that right balance. Yeah, um, having a um, you know an inside outside attack and and not just inside inside because then it, then it takes away the enjoyment of the, of everybody around us. I think it's way more attractive when you're moving the ball. Um, but you know at the same time, it's each individual team playing to the strengths of, of the players that they have. I'm glad, and we're going to talk a little bit of defense. But uh, one of my things uh, in talking about our defense versus a dominant post player has traditionally been that we need to take away the guards first look because their inherent nature is to not look again and not want to look again because the guard doesn't want to pass it inside. Have you found that as well as something that you have to coach a little bit out of the guards? Yeah. And that's why I talked about post passing. It's yeah. like when they're open, they miss the opportunity to get it in and then they think they have to get it in. So they kind of force the action and we have a turnover and it makes it really stagnant. And it's so true. It's, you know, I think, um, you know, right now it's, you know, we're developing um, young players and they're you know, working on their handles and the shooting, but are we working on, you know, the passing as much as we should? Are we working on the defense as much as we should. Um, yeah, probably not. But, yeah, it, it's so true in that regard. They kind of, you know, they got to kind of get a little tunnel vision and they just look for one option and instead of just reading defences. So, yeah, I mean, it's a thing that we continue to work on. Um, so I haven't quite got there yet, so hopefully I will. <laughs> well, we won't because the guards don't always want to. But uh, it's, it's, it's good to understand that psychology a little bit too. And uh, as you said, transparency is to just bring that out and just say, hey, this is a reality. We've got to change it if we want to be successful. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And, um, you know, I think about, you know, I, I know, like I'm the first to admit when I make mistakes, it's like and that's a part of uh, growing. Um, you have to have those experiences and you learn and you can and, and have growth. So it's just more about showing video and how we can get open. But it's not just about I I don't want to just pound it in. I know last year and Diana didn't play well, she was injured most of the year. And, you know, we we had to play a lot. You know, we used Brittany not just as scoring an option, but as a as a playmaker in the post because she was demanding so much attention down there that you that was, I thought that's yeah, the best way that we could be effective. But, you know, this year changed a little bit. Obviously, BG wasn't with us a lot during the season, but, you know, we brought playmakers in because I knew, I think the hardest thing to guard in basketball is pick and roll. And I've got some really good pick and roll players. And um, and then it's about the movement out of it, getting BG out of movement, not just, you know, punching it in on a stationary catch where she's more easily guarded. So what is the biggest challenge on defense of playing with a dominant post player? You can't be as aggressive. Um, you know, obviously everybody, me included, you want to put the the big player in pick and rolls. I mean, why? Because, you know, their mobility is not quite like a, a more agile post player. Um, so you can't be as aggressive in pick and roll defense. And also you want to, you know, open up the lane a little bit to take away, um, you know, to limit the shot blocking opportunities at the rim that um, BG is obviously very good at. Um, so, yeah, look, um, you know, if you can be effective, but it's, you know, she's not going to be in a hard hedge because of recovery. She doesn't move that well that she can get back and, you know, there's opportunities for her to get in foul trouble. So a lot of it's more, you know, just keeping her at the point of the screen, a lot of drop action here, you know, occasionally an ice. Um, but, you know, you put more onus on the guards and making sure that they're getting through and, and making sure that our, you know, our team defense or our help side defense is positioned um, that we can close the gaps behind it. I, I've asked some NBA and WNBA coaches this question before because it's fascinating to me. The challenges of playing without one of those players on the floor. And I'm curious, do you actually end up basically having a completely different system? when on offense, especially when one of those players is off the floor or how do you handle that? Well, I think uh, this year was, I think we showed that um, in, you know, Brittany was with us for the first half of the season and we had a, a five new players joining us this year and, you know, it took us a while, like a, a, not much of a preseason and, um, you know, and we didn't have everyone involved and we, we lacked a little, we weren't really as cohesive as we wanted to be, but, you know, once, um, you know, obviously BG left the team, it's not 
we had the styles in place. It's just that she wasn't on it. And I just put them in positions where, okay, this is what we're doing. We're running a lot of pick and rolls. We had, you know, Kia Vaughn, I thought was a revelation for us and because she was a player that is very smart, um, great screener, but she can also obviously knock down those open shots. So we kind of played a more out of a five out, even though Brianna Turner is not an outside shooter. We put her in positions where she's a cutter and a screener on the off seat, off ball action, that it created, um, you know, more movement, obviously. We played at a higher speed. I think we we had the, um, you know, we had the best pace in the WNBA, so which, we, which was great for us. But we had fairly good pace with BG. Um, so it's just that, we, you know, we never – pounded it inside because we occasionally would Kia would roll up but a lot of it was just out of movement cutting on and off ball screens to to get open and and it was quite effective for us yeah I love it and uh you know just these questions that coaches have to think about and uh you know that's that's part of how you have to play sometimes when you have these unique talents is you have to figure out what to do when they're not there and that's great to hear in terms of that. And uh, coach, we also want to get into a little bit of defense and you've got a number of clinics online and I've, I've had the good fortune to watch a few of them. So I want to get your thoughts, especially on some of the terminology that you use, but uh, give us an impression a little bit initially just on some of your defensive philosophies. Well, look, I think the first thing, I, you know, as a player, I think people will know me more as a as an offensive player, but they're better than solid defensive player, but not uh, spectacular, but, you know, smart, um, but, you know, offense. I, I could score, you know, I know how I want to play. But when I w- went into coaching, you know, my philosophy is you've got to play defense. If you want to be the best team, if you want to win championships, you have to be a, a great defensive team. And that is a mindset. Um, everyone loves offense, but you know you have to be committed to defense. You have to have buy-in from every single player. Um, so for me, it's more about, and I don't put the onus on just you know one-on-one defense is important, but it's not the most important thing. So it's not going to influence everything else. Um, so what I rely on, it's I always talk about team team defense. Obviously, stance and positioning on the on the on the ball is important. Uh, when a screen is coming, obviously it's driven by who's coming off that screen and how aggressive that we can be. But it's the positioning of the people off the ball. I mean, basically you're zoning up, and people you probably people talk have called it pack defense. I just basically say, you know, we got to close the gaps. You're inside to outside, so we have active stunting to the ball, but appropriate help. Like when do you need to be a little bit more aggressive and when not. Um, so it's really a, a five-player defense where all the pieces have to work together to be most effective. Well, so you talked about inside to outside, early help, early recovery. I want you to also talk about stunt the stunner. I think that's one of the unique things I've heard you talk about. Yeah, look, obviously, unless we were – the only time we wouldn't do that would be in a hard hedge on, a, 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 you know, obviously in a side pick and roll where we would need, you know, we'd have to be – you have to look at rotation and the backside guard would have to be on top of the post if it was low or ready for the rotation. But if we're in a soft hedge when there is – you know, we're trying to stay in plays – um, the idea is, uh, you know, we're coming off a side pick and roll and then someone should be on the nail, you know, depending on who's coming off. But it's so that's the inside to outside. It's your early preparation is critical because you never, if you want to stunt outside to inside, you've created separation. And obviously in basketball, that's our goal to try and create openings um, for a shot or, or, or a driver or the next uh, creating you know, scramble defense to get even better look. So, so to start the stunner is really if someone's stunting, the other person needs to be stunting up to their man. So you should be playing in between the ball and, and your man at all times. And if you're the stunt, the stunner at person, you're playing between the first stunter and your man into the corner without losing sight. Um, so it's just mate, like if we stun someone on a side pick and rolls coming off, the high stunt is there. Uh, the handler sees a crowd and no opening. So the, what's, what are they going to do is usually they're going to pass it to the next person in line with them, um, unless it was a throwback, but the same things apply there. But on the flight of the ball, the, st- the stunner person is already stunting up to the ball and it allows the person that actually stunted in the pick and roll to get back in plays and create no openings. And then the person that did stump from the corner is already in the gap that take away the dribble penetration, but at the same time in a position to close out to his man if there was a quick ball reversal. 
So I know that's hard to explain when just talking about it. So hopefully I didn't confuse too many people. <laughs> I love it. No, I love hearing it. Love hearing the terminology and the way you phrase it. And uh, again, coach, coaches, you can go. I mean, uh, Sandy has some clinics, uh, FIBA clinics and Australian basketball clinics that are on YouTube. So you can find this and you can see some examples of her working with it. But uh, another unique thing is now getting your perspective because you've coached these unique players. Let's get your perspective defensively on how you would stop them. So what would be your preference to try and stop a dominant big or maybe one or two ways you would do that? Stop a dominant big? Yeah, let's start with a dominant big. Yeah, well, obviously in pick and roll defense, you know, everyone's going to, you know, put their best big in because they're trying to get some kind of separation. So it really starts with, um, you know, obviously it's the, 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 the stunting behind the ball is critical for guarding a big because we wouldn't get too aggressive. We wouldn't hard hedge, especially if we wanted to keep a, our biggest big on the opponent's, you know, dominant post player um, in staying in play. So, you know, it'll be over under concepts from the guard, depending on, you know, the shooting ability of the person coming off the ball. Having the stunt person there allows it, the post player in pick and rolls, even if we're in soft hedge, I don't let them go more than two. It's more like it's like a one slide lateral and then you're already on a retreat into um, you're know, trying to jam the post player high or at that, if it was a throwback to get onto the top side or a three-quarter front or a full front if needed. Um, so it's more by not limiting the separation. you still got to have a, some help um, in a pick and roll, but staying close enough to the big that you can uh, be close on a recovery and roll them up and then make it hard for them to catch the ball or at least pushing them off the block so that our next line of defense can get set up. Love it. Love the depth of this. And uh, let's let's go to a dominant perimeter score or someone dominant off the ball screen like Diana Trossi. Well, I think Diana sees the most traps of any player. <laughs> so, look, I think you know, Diana, and that's why we wanted to play with a little bit more pace. Um, Diana is fantastic in uh, transition. Um, I think she's got the most points in, in fast break this year uh, by just running drag actions because you're taking away the trap. You're taking away, you know, obviously she has a little bit more separation for her to get the ball off, and she doesn't need much space, trust me. Um, but, look, in a, in, a, in a pick and roll on the side, um, you know, I try, I try and take away the, the stationary pick and rolls with her because you're going to trap her. But, you know, to, to, to isolate players like that, I'm, I should be talking about defense now, is players are going to trap, obviously, and it's being aggressive with trap and, and making sure that we're denying first passes away and keeping our hands, you know, hands is, you know, we don't use our hands enough. Um, I think in Australia in the Opals, we're drilled from a very young age about bo- uh, hand pressure tracing the ball. And I don't think it's kind of a lost cause in the um, in the players coming into the WNBA um, because it's not something that was emphasized in, in, in their college or where, maybe where they were coming from. Some do, but not all. But util- utilizing hands um, – can lead to deflections and turnovers, which can lead to fast break. So it's been being really active with uh, your hands, um, and then obviously just making sure that uh, you know when there there is a trap, you you're communicating it well, so they can't split and um, having a, appropriate angles on those. Well, you, and you t- talked about uh, you know playing whatever we want to say in the pack, in the gaps. So let's talk a little bit about defending the three-point line, which is obviously so important in this game, uh, modern game. So can you talk about some of the different things that maybe you've adjusted to be able to defend the three-point line a little bit better? Yeah, look, (laughs) adjustment, we'll probably still give up too many. Um, And that's where it comes down to overhaul help. You know, in defense, when you got great, when you're playing against the best teams, um, that you, as a coach, you've got to decide what do you want to, you know, what are you going to give up? You know, ideally I'd like to, like the analytics say, give up the mid range, um, as more, you know, my goal is let's protect the paint. Okay. Let's contest without fouling, but then let's have a sense of urgency on closeouts. Let's make sure every shot is being contested and that you've got to be committed to that. You know, defense is, is obviously, you know, it's a, it's an instinctful thing. You've got to realize, you know, you, sometimes you can't just tell them you got to help here. They've got to act. It's been active. I never want stationary defenders. I want to make sure they're on their, 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 you know, their toes, they're moving, they're stunning quick, they're recovering quick, the closeout positioning is right. But knowing that it is team defense, so if you get broken down, someone's going to be there for you. So it's, 
you know, for me, it's more early help, early recovery, you know, contest without fouling. It's having that sense of urgency. Now, obviously, if Diana Trussi was off the ball and, and a pick and roll handler was coming off that, you know, we thought that wasn't the best pick and roll. Well, our help would be shorter. We'd still be in a position because I think you have to build habits, but it would be a, an, uh, uh, a little quicker recovery. And if the handler did drive downhill, our goal for that person defending the handler is stay in place and stay at home. And let's see if they can finish over a, a, you know, a defender and a hand instead of overhelping and creating open threes. My pet peeve is when we help off like a baseline penetration, we help off the corner. We know that's where the ball's going. In a high horns action where, um, you know, we help off strong side and we give up a three. They're, they're not our rules. So that's when I get most um, angry because I, the players, especially the players that have been in the system a long time, it's like, okay, well, you're not focused because that's not what we're supposed to do. But at times you have to make a decision and we want to make sure we're giving shots to the players we want to give shots, not to the ones that obviously are great three-point shooters. Hey, Coach, a quick interruption from this episode for a mention from our supporters who, without them, this podcast would not be possible. By using the links I mentioned in these advertisements, it enables me to continue providing this podcast for free for you. The wait is finally over. Football is in full effect, with many teams strutting their stuff. You might not be at a game this year, but you can still be in on the action at Bet Online. Bet Online is going the extra mile to make sure you can get in on everything imaginable this season. From game spreads and totals to team, player, and coaching props, Bet Online gives you more options to wager than any place online. Head to Bet Online today and use promo code ARMCHAIR, that's ARMCHAIR in all capitals, to take advantage of all the great sign up bonuses. Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts. Listen up, fellows, because today we have a new Manscaped product alert. Manscaped just released the Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer. Take a look in the mirror and I guarantee you'll see hair sticking out of those holes. It's time to keep your ear and nose hair looking as nice as your clean-shaven pubes. Manscaped is forever changing the grooming game with their Weed Whacker. The Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer provides proprietary skin-safe technology, which helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate holes. The premium Manscaped Weed Whacker uses a 9,000 RPM motor-powered 360-degree rotary dual blade system. Its intelligently contoured design enhances the trimming experience and it is waterproof which makes for easy operation and cleaning. Look fellas, 79% of partners polled admitted that long nose hair is a major turnoff. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code armchair at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code armchair. What are you waiting for? Go whack your weed. Thank you, Manscaped, for keeping our pubes trimmed and hairs in our holes looking nice. Now back to the podcast. Yeah, tremendous. Great points there, Coach, all the way through there. So interested now in terms of we've got a good feel for your defensive philosophy. How do you build it? How, how do you go about install and building your defense? Well, I actually use a lot of um, three-on-three to start, you know, just working on the tagging and the positioning and building it up. Um, you know, in a soft hedge, we this is how we're doing it and being at the point of the screen in a drop, getting through screens, positioning on and off the ball. Um, but a lot of it is done really in shell. I think every coach uses shell. There's a fan of shell. It's the four-on-four. Takes one person out. Just means obviously you've got to work a little bit harder. You've got to communicate. You've got to cover ground a little bit more. Um, so that creates, you know, a, a lot of talk. And to be great defensive teams, you have to have talk. And that's, you know, sometimes, you know, I have so sometimes really, really quiet players and it's, it drives me crazy. And it's like, you know, you don't hear anyone talking because talking builds trust. And without trust, you don't have anything, especially if you're on the ball. You know, they're going to work extremely hard if you can hear people telling me, you got to help this way, okay, you got your, um, you know, push it this way. And, you know, you feel like, okay, it can build confidence in you. You may not have to be the best, the greatest defender on the ball, but you know that your team is there behind you. So a lot of four on four, breaking it down, um, on ball, off ball, um, and or, or just one on one, the positioning of it, you know, the closeouts, like the stunt, the stunner. You've got to build concepts um, as much as you can. And I think, and it all just comes down to repetition. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And repetition is obviously so important. And uh, also curious then with the four and four shell, uh, do you find any disconnect, especially say at the professional level that you coach at when it becomes these five on five situations because you've removed that one player or conversely, how quickly do you progress to the five on five? Look, I progress pretty quickly. I mean, I think I've, uh, especially early in the year, there's way more four and four because I'm just setting the foundation and the concepts so that there is clarity in what we want to do and it's in the half court. But I'm quickly going to the five on five just so we know where, where all the action, where all the help is coming from in an overloaded side, on a, on a two-man two game side, um, in, in everything that we do. I think the more we practice whole part, the better you get. Um, so I, I want them to play and experience and, you know, we'll stop it, um, you know, try not to too much, but I, I will say I will probably do at times um, to, to create, create the, correct the mistakes that, that, that's being made. But all, at the same time, I want them to be proactive. You know what I mean? Don't, don't be reactive, be proactive. You know, sometimes you're going to make a wrong decision by thinking that you have you know, an opportunity to, to do something. But I don't like when we're creating offense. We're just making poor judgment calls of of going for a steal when we really should just be staying and play, play and staying at home as much as we can. So at all levels of basketball, but uh, especially, again, you're coaching at the professional and the international level, your team is going to be in scramble. And one of the phrases that the phrasings that you've used is when you're in scramble defense, push the ball back where it came from. Can you explain that to coaches? Yeah, no, definitely. Well, you know, my goal, I try and stay out of scramble, but obviously the talent pool that we have, you're going to be in scramble. So obviously if we overhelp on a, a penetrator to the middle um, so the stunt, the stunner person is, is obviously stunning up to the person that's open from the person that overhelped is not allowing them to pass it directly to the next person that would be in the corner. So it's more about, I always say in the stunning thing, it's more shallow triangles, um, you know, hands and arms and passing lanes so we can get deflections. But really on a scramble, you're trying to make sure we push it back to where the ball came from and you're not allowing them the movement where it's further for the next defender to get out there. So really you're going to give up an open shot in the corner unless you close out to the person that gets the ball out of the rotation and you deny the ball to the corner. You close an out to him, but your hands and arms are in pass lanes and, and deterring that pass. And even if it does get there, um, just slowing down the pass will maybe help that the next rotation will be in play and we're back in position. I love it. I love hearing this. And, uh, uh, another thing that you've talked about is that you play one-on-one -on -one for personal related differences to learn these differences between players. Can you explain that again? Yeah, look, obviously one-on-one -on -one def defense is more, you know, we want to have ball, you know, hey, like you taught from the young age, I'm, I'm a youth coach, I coach my daughter's team as well. And we're talking about it's ball, you, man. I mean, that's critical in every one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but look, obviously as players get better, they have tendencies. And, um, you know, a lot of right-handed players love to go left. That's just, that's their comfort. It's easy to get the ball in the shot pocket to shoot. So in one-on-one -on -one situations like that, we try and force them to their weak hand as much as we can without giving direct penetration. Now, what's that mean? That means, well, you don't want to open up your inside leg and, and give um, a direct line to the basket because really that's what we're trying to protect. Um, so it's more about, you know, we we say, we don't say force certain way, we say shade more so than force because I say, when I say force, it kind of opens up lanes to the basket and I'll, my goal is obviously to keep people out of the paint so that we can stay in plays and stay at home and be able to contest as, uh, as many shots as we can. I love it. I love it. The, the ability to be able to uh, play and learn tendencies out of one-on-one -on -one is such a valuable part for all levels of players, but especially those youth players where you get them to start to think about, okay, what is your, what is the offensive player's strength and how can you take it away? And it's almost as simple as that, asking the question to get them to think that way. Right. Yeah, it is so true because, you know, obviously having experience coaching uh, um, my daughter's team with my husband and, and she's 10 and all the players, um, you know, they're young. They're learning the game. And we work a lot on the skills and fundamentals and also defense. And it's always like 
Okay, which hand she wants to dribble with? Right, so what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, so you're making them think. It's like, well, don't let her dribble right. But, you know, they're so young that they're still adapting to what's right and what's left, you know, because when you're facing the other way, well, you know, it's your left hand and not your right hand. Um, but it's fun just to see everyone has a, a, has a strong tendency, um, you know, even the very best doesn't mean they can't go uh, the other way, but you certainly want to make sure that you're forcing them into the way that you think that you can stay in plays and, and make it a little bit harder for them instead of giving them, you know, you know, Dinah Trussy, you know, which way she wants to go. Well, I don't want to tell everybody. I'm sure they know, but, uh, you know, that way yeah. because yeah, it's not going to help them. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. And uh, another concept I'd love you to talk about, and assuming you still believe in this, you've talked about on these some of these clinics blowing up handoffs, which I just love that. Can you talk about how you blow up handoffs? Yeah, look, blowing up handoffs, it's just making it really hard for the guard who is getting the dribble handoff, um, you know, giving them the freedom to use the screen. Um, so blowing it up, it's more you know, the handler's coming towards you. Instead of letting them just do a really smooth transition of just handing it off to the next player, we kind of get into their passing lane and we play obviously close into their body without fouling and then blowing it up, which means even if they, you know, they may have to back cut, but, you know, we're all, I always talk about back foot denial unless I want a foot front denial, total front denial to, um, but usually I want to keep them out of the paint. So it's usually back foot denial. So just blowing up the handler is trying to play in between the ball and your um, offensive player trying to come off that action. Love it. Love it. And uh, you're talking uh, about a few other things in terms of this, but uh, we talk about how analytics have affected your defensive philosophy. Have they, has it changed much since, you know, the rise of analytics over the last 10 plus years? Um. Yes and no, to be quite honest. Look, obviously everyone looks at analytics and and I think they have a part in the game, um, but I don't put total, you know, emphasis on that. Look, we were the th- we had, we took the third most threes this year, um, you know, in the in the WNBA, but we gave up too many too, but that was a little bit of overhelp and, and having a sense of urgency. But, you know, teams like Seattle, when they can spread you out, the five out, it is a difficult um, system to guard. Um, and there's certain times you just, you've got to, you know, for me, I'm like saying, well, who do we want shooting the ball? I think that's what it comes down to. But look, analytics definitely play a part in, in my preparation, um, about what I want to stop. I think they don't lie, obviously. Um, but you know, I, I still want to be consistent with how I want to play that, you know, we make tweaks depending obviously the opponent that we're playing that day. Talk about overhelping it's got to be still one of the biggest challenges for us as coaches to, to get players to understand when to help and when not to help and their tendency when we teach defense so well is that they're going to help when not necessary can you talk about how you build that with your team <laughs> i'm still trying to build it um me too me too yeah, yeah look it's a uh, You know, I think you just got to continue to talk about concepts. You know, I I spoke before about, you know, baseline penetration. You know, is the defender in plays? Are they going under the basket? I mean, I, you know, don't overhelp. And it's an automatic rule. Don't overhelp off the corner. Now, when do you need to help is when there's a blow by, the defender's two feet away. Well, obviously, we get into rotations and then you have to play drop defense. You know, it's the help, the helper concept then. Um, But look, there's certain situations, you know, there's penetration. If we are in play, well, we don't need to over help, especially one pass away or where the, the, the direct line of the penetrator, that's where she can see. So a middle penetration, the person in the corner, you're the one that that person generally will look to pass the ball to. So don't overhelp, but can we stay in play? So, you know, it, it's a, you have to obviously have a lot of focus and you have to have a lot of repetition and, and they get it. You know, you'll see players put hands up <laughs> Oh my bad. Um, because in the heat of the moment, and I totally get it, being there, done that, I wasn't t- certainly perfect, um, is just, you know, there's so many things going through with so much movement um, and obviously all the talent that we have that sometimes I think you just get lost. You want to be a, you want to make sure you're, you're a great help side defender, but there's a time to do it and when not. So I think it's just consistent in your messaging um, and just reminding and then keep uh, 
And sometimes you don't even have to practice it because I think they know it. It's just more repeating it. Okay, remember, you overhelp, stunt, recover. Um, it's being active. So I think if they can stay active off the ball and not standing, I think that's when their brain works a little bit better. <laughs> Well, and yeah, absolutely. And I love this phrasing that uh, that I want to share. And that's that you said is help is a de- decision making process, not a reflex. Help is a decision making process, not a reflex. I just love anytime someone brings decision making into defense because I don't think we talk about that enough. Yeah, no, it's so true. I think all defense is a decision making. It's just like on offense. You know, it's kind of like a chess game, isn't it? Because, you know, offensively, it's all about decision-making. How are they defending our players and how can we create separation to get a great shot every single time? And defensively, you know, we're strategizing how can we make sure that they take poor shots every single time, okay, the shots or the shots that we want them to be taken. Um, So, look, it's a decision-making, and that's why you have to the shell drill, you know, uh, the three-on-three, the shell drill, uh, the five on five is important because they have to learn to play together, okay? And communication, and then we talk, I talked about talk. You have to talk because to build trust. And without trust, you have nothing. And then in the game, it's just making those split, de- uh, split decisions. Um, at that time, what you think is best, and hopefully it was the best, but being active with our hands. I, you know, the, like I said, the hands are underestimated at times, and it's something I'm still trying to, um, improving my team just being active with your hands like tracking deflections it's you know maybe I don't do it enough but it is so important because it brings you so many more extra possessions that you can take down to the offensive end and another another thing which I love that you said is that uh, when was the last time you saw a social media clip with someone practicing defense and that the rise of the trainers has created a younger generation whose defensive skills are less developed by the time they get to you. Yes, with, without a doubt. Look, obviously, offense, you know, the offensive players getting the biggest contracts, aren't they? I mean, you know, so yep. I, I, I totally get it. And, if, and hey, hands up, I'm no different. I mean, I went to practice and, I, you know, individual work was a lot on shooting and, and getting open and, and not an, enough work on defense because really defense is hard. I mean, that's hard. I mean, that's, you need a lot of heart for that. And, you know, I admire the players. That's their, you know, that's what they're known of. The Elisa Clarks from, um, you know, Seattle when they, they just, they take so much pride in that. And, you know, without those kind of players, teams wouldn't have the greatest success, but at the same time, very valuable on offense because plays their role, um, you know, fantastically, but, you know, I, you know, defense wins championships. And I think now, obviously, um, you know, being from Australia and, and living in America for so long, I just see and, and coaching new sports, it's, this, it's too much zone. So, you know, it's the organisations and that, they're allowing um, teams to play zone. How are we supposed to develop um, individual defence and team defence in a man-to-man if they're not practising it from a young age? And I'm talking about, you know, you know, 10, we don't, like, team we coach, we may lose every game, but we're playing man-to-man because, you know, we're trying to um, prepare them for the future if they, t- you know, want to have a, uh, you know, basketball career moving forward. Um, but I understand, you know, players, uh, coaches think, you know, it's all about winning. And, you know, maybe it is. It's, you know, obviously in the college as well too. But there's a lot of zones. And I, I think there's use in zone too. I think the one thing I didn't talk about in FIBA basketball, there's way more zone play. There's way more, you know, presses play. Um, because you have more, you know, obviously that's just because you're allowed to stand in the paint a little bit and the NBA is using way more zone too. But I, I think we're not teaching them at a young age um, to to enjoy playing defense and um, but teaching them the concepts to be really good defenders. Well, let's talk about then your daughter's age. Let's talk about that. You're playing man, obviously you've talked about that, but talk about how you elicit buy-in from that age group and then how you reinforce the value of defense. Uh, they're so young they have to like uh my husband Olaf Lang and I I mean we, they know that we're coaches like well this is what we're going to do you know because it's we're, we're teaching our goal is to teach fundamentally sound young basketball players to help them as they move forward um so they don't know any different um you know we might have played a zone here and there but pr- predominantly it's about men and it takes time because you know we're talking about 
know, this is a uh, 10 year olds, 11 year olds, okay, ball player men, you know, stance, positioning, use your hands, um, um, you know, knowing who you're guarding, speed. And then you have to obviously slowly put into, okay, where's the help side? You know, that takes time because all, you know, but when they're young, they're just worried about their man, <laughs> you know. So, but it's a process. You're kind of teaching them the concept. So when they actually get into, you're preparing them better. So when they get into the college, they're actually, oh, yeah, okay, ball, you man, gotcha. Okay, shallow triangles off ball. I'm in a position, you know, stunning and all that kind of stuff. So we're starting the process now. Is it, uh, is it easy? No. <laughs> it's painful at times. Um, but I think it's very valuable for them um, as young basketball players, especially moving forward. And just for people with that reference to your husband, Olaf, so Russian powerhouse, UMMC, uh, incredible success there. I think five straight Russian championships, if I remember it, and uh, EuroLeague titles as well. So, and, and obviously WNBA experience. So imagine showing up to practice and having both of you coach the 10 year old team. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I think, the kid, I think the kids enjoy it. I'm not sure if my daughter enjoys it so much. I know my son doesn't really enjoy us coaching him, but. Uh... <laughs> But we want to play, and, and really to the point, we want to praise players. We still want to praise players to play defense, and uh, you know we want to commend them for their effort, right? Yeah, look, I think that's the most important thing is you know to have success is when we're all on the same page, and 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 I, I always talk about a closed fist. Is if if we are a closed fist, that means that we're doing it together at both ends of the floor. That's the only way that you can have success. If one person, if you stick your finger out, I mean, we're 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 all over the plane. We don't have chemistry. We don't have harmony. We don't have teamwork. Um, and that's what it's about. You know, that's our culture. That's our values. We want unity. We want to play defense, okay, but we know it's team defense. Um, so come in and do your best. Do your best. Do your job to make us be be great. Um, and that's where the accountability comes in. Um, you know, for me, like I try and hold the accountable on defense because I know that's what we're going to need if we want to have the most success that we can have. Um, but look, it's it, you know it's getting buy-in. Um, you know, obviously WNBA and, and and the Opals. It's like, well, you don't play defense. You're probably not going to be playing at this level anyway. And um, you know, you have to be committed. Um, you know, it's hard work, but you have to be committed. So many great things can come from. And you don't, you know, as I said, like, you know, you're still having five people on the same page. Um, you know, when you have that kind of chemistry. You go out there and have fun. And really, that's why we play the game, don't we? I mean, I think we all have so much passion for this game. It, it is fun, even through the hard times. It's still fun because you get to do something that you love. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Coach, uh, just so much knowledge being dropped and uh, can't thank you enough. And before we go, we, we got to get your perspective. I had a great chance to be able to visit Australia and do an extensive time there last January. And uh, give us some perspective on the Australian development system, the Australian Institute of Sport and the development that happens there. I mean, basketball, you just do such a great job in that country and have such a great passion for basketball. Yeah, we do. Look, it, it really... Um... Look, I just know, just going back to my career, and I attended the Australian Institute of Sport. This is where it targets um, all the young athletes that you have potential to, to represent uh, Australia in all different sports. So it's just a really um, just a great environment. Like for me, that's when really my career started to change um, when I moved there. You know, really probably got narrow focus, probably a little bit too much, but just to have everything access to me, have the best coaches really help me develop the game and you know it's a stepping stone I made the Australian team and as, as you can say the rest is is history but what I think in Australia what we do I think obviously it starts with the coaches and the coaches are being educated as well um, because without them with their knowledge they wouldn't be able to obviously pass it on to the players um, so I think basketball Australia do, do a great job in all, all the the state associations of developing their coaches first and then it helps the players you know we've been targeted at a young age we're getting really good coaching um, mine was you know obviously I went to the Australian Institute of Sport and just getting the best coaching day in day out certainly helped me to be the best player that I could be and gave me a good foundation leading into the rest of my career um, and you know right now it's not the Australian Institute of Sport anymore it's called the Centre of Excellence and we still have like 13 young ladies going in and all of them go to college. All of them, like all, you know, Gemma Potter, you you would hear they're all, obviously everyone's looking to Australians and um, trying to recruit them to their program. So, so many Australians are playing over there. Um, I think 
everyone talks about Australians just having really good fundamentals and that's really what the focus of, of is when we're young um, but also very coachable, good t- good teammates um, and hard workers. And, why you know, I think that goes without saying that's what coaches want in players when you're looking at them, um, you know, play their role well. But a lot of it is to come from our, obviously, the centre of excellence and they're doing a, continu- a fantastic job and the WNBL is is playing at the moment in Australia and a, a, a young player the name of Jade Melbourne um, 18 years of age. Um, we have no imports this year. She's getting a great opportunity and and, and playing extremely well. So, yeah, it's the, yeah, I think Australia does a great job. And I think, uh, you know, other countries do as well. I know uh, in Europe they have similar things. And I think that certainly helps our development. And the Opals are ranked number two in the world. And so are under 19. And, and we know, obviously, our boomers hope to get a, a medal uh, next year at Tokyo. Yeah, well, we hope Tokyo happens. And uh, Coach, I cannot thank you enough. We wish you all the best with all your your different coaching jobs. I, I said two, but you actually have four now, right? Coaching your son and your daughter and, you know, on the side, the Olympic team and in the WNBA. That's pretty good. Yeah, my, I don't coach my son. I had to go, oh, oh, okay. actually, in school I do, so um, I do coach my son. I do actually, yes, yes, I do four teams, but <laughs> but it's Tremendous. fun. I love, giving, I love giving back and um, you know, and, and helping where I can, and, and but continuing to grow too. You know, I love talking to other coaches, and um, you know, I think I, I just I'm like a sponge. I want to make sure that I'm continuing to learn too, so I can uh, be a better coach each and every year. Well, thank you for sharing the game with us. Are you welcome anytime. Thanks for listening. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and to give the Basketball Podcast and this week's guest a shout out on social media to show your support for us sharing the game. And to stay up to date on all things Basketball Immersion, subscribe to our newsletter at basketballimmersion.com newsletter. Mm-hmm.